Welcome to Planet the Climates. Planet of the Climates is a community organized podcast to bring you the latest information and insight into the Klima DAO ecosystem. Klima is a blockchain protocol backed by carbon credits that gives people a chance to fight climate change as a collective and get rewarded for doing so. Klima sits at the intersection of cryptocurrency, game theory, and the carbon credit markets, so there's no shortage of great stuff for us to talk about. If making a profit while fighting climate change sounds too good to be true, you're not alone. And today's guest, Cujo, actually started their journey with that same question. So with this episode, we're going to shed some light on what's going on under the Klima hood, looking beyond the price and keeping our eyes on that long term prize of impacting carbon markets and helping solve the climate crisis. My name is Phaedrus, I'll be your host on this adventure, and I'm joined as usual by my good friends and co-hosts, Reg and Diamond Hands, as we discuss the latest Klima news, drop some great alpha for you, and connect you with the biggest and brightest minds currently exploring this space. Reg, why don't you just let us know why you're excited to talk with Cujo today? I am interested in policy. I really like to get under the hood, as you mentioned, and learn about what levers the policy team has to pull to affect changes in the health of the protocol. So I'm really interested in learning more about this. I think uh, a lot of our community will be too. Yep. For me, it's like the Dune dashboard. It's something that I look on it on a daily basis and understanding the matrix and like what works, what takes. Like I'm still learning as well. And it'd be great to talk to the person who actually created the Klima Tune dashboard and to understand like what matrix matter to him and how does it all fit to the whole picture of you know Klima being you know, resilient and a sustainable protocol for the long run. Yes, Kujo was already a legend for creating these Dune dashboards, and definitely that's something I'm hyped to uh, to hear about from him a little bit more behind the dashboards. But I think just overall, really, just a chance to you know meet another key personality, a key figure behind Klima, and just kind of learn more about um, Kujo's journey, how they found themselves in this role, and the role they play. But uh, yeah, that's you know enough about us and what we're excited about. But yeah, let's just throw to the interview here and hope you enjoy. So Cujo is our guest on this episode of the Planet of the Climates podcast. He's not only a lead on Klima's policy team, but also the creator of our beloved Dune dashboard, where people can take a look under the hood of the Klima Dow treasury to get a better understanding of how our protocol works and how it's performing over time. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us, Cujo. I know many of our listeners will be excited to hear from you as a key player on the policy team and all the information you're going to be able to share. But let's just, you know, back things up first. Why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about you, who you are, maybe a little bit about your work experience, your previous crypto experience, and just how you got involved in the Klima project to begin with. Yeah, no, uh, first, you know, thanks for having me on here. I got started on the crypto side of things back when I did... Uh, did some IT work a long time ago. I managed to mine some uh, Dogecoin back then, believe it or not. <laughs> I had since lost the key, like uh, like oh. everybody else. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, so, so that was kind of a, it, it was interesting uh, that came up. And I was looking around at things this summer and, and just wanted to invest in kind of, I think I'd, I'd seen a few articles on, you know, some like green uh, crypto and that kind of got me intrigued and that's when i saw the apys that were being paid out to people and i was like this can't be real because i right you know right now my my history is i, I did it for a few years and now i'm a, a licensed accountant and so it was like hey you know, I've, I've got a little bit of money to to throw around there and and i quickly learned what being a degen was jumped in and out of a few farms on a polygon since uh, it was it was right right in the beginning of a uh, may this year i literally bought the top popped around in that i, I got to experience the fun that was uh iron finance and titan on polygon is that how you met uh mr cuban uh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think i met kujo there as well at titan <laughs> yeah that was one of the projects that i also got burned so i mean i i got i got lucky uh on that one i i, I got out uh safe on that one but it also kind of taught me um just just the mechanics of that you know like the whole arbitrage and pegging uh, assets and, and kind of the, the different financial 
models and ecosystems that people are just creating um, out of kind of thin air, you know, like think it up and, and do it. That was really fascinating to me from a, you know, just from a finance perspective. So I kind of dug in and I was looking around on Reddit one day and randomly came across Olympus and bridged some money back over to, to ETH and hopped in there and kind of just let it sit for a while. But, uh, you know, the more and more it, it performed and it did things and I got more curious about those tokenomics and how those worked. That's kind of where that led me to where I am today. So I, I don't, I do not have a finance background. You know, I, I'm a kind of a, just a basic retail investor. And when I saw Olympus, it did not click for me at first. Like it took me about a month and a half or so to get comfortable with what was going on there. And actually it was, I think hearing about, you know, Klima and, and some other protocols when I really dug in that I kind of finally got it. But from you coming from a finance background or at least accounting, um, you know, did it, did it click for you quickly or like, tell me about how you came to learn about or, or become kind of sold on Olympus. It didn't, it did not click for me initially. No, I, I threw some money in cause there was a, a high APY and I was like, okay, cool. They're backing something with a dollar and, about, you know, probably about a month or two of being in the discord and, and reading through some of the policy chats and the other channels. And, um, that was right when, you know, OIP 18 and a whole lot of other kind of pivotal proposals kind of came forth. And, and those really kind of drove me to investigate the mechanics of it a bit more. And that's kind of where I was like, yeah, this could work. Um, like, like this, this makes sense as far as like the fact that it's a long term play. And that was one of the things that I had, I'd learned doing the, a lot of the yield farming stuff, you know, like in the couple months before, it's like, these are all just super short term. You know, a lot of people, it's a super, super short term. You got to get in, get out kind of thing. And this is like, okay, like looking through, like kind of diving into the docs and seeing how it works. It's like, okay, I could really just stick some money in there and, and really walk away and, and feel good knowing that there's a, a treasury behind it and that, there is some value at the end of the day. And and that's what really sold sold it for me. Yeah. So you you talked about again, like your kind of first exposure, your learning curve there with Ohm. Um if we just kind of again bring that back to Klima when you're talking about the carbon now. So how does that really, you know, change the protocol and what's going on under the hood in terms of the resiliency of the protocol versus Ohm, kind of that first experience you had there? So the the really fascinating thing that that I really wanted to dive into with Klima. And I think the biggest, one of the, one of the larger experiments that we're, we're doing here with Klima is utilizing this non-stable asset as the backing token. As you know, Olympus and a lot of the other forks that have popped up, you know, they all still use stable coins as their primary backing, which it's stable. And that's kind of where, you know, it's a stable, it, it is, you know, truly risk-free and that it'll, be stable down to that level, but carbon, um, you know, the risk and reward aspect of this, we're using carbon, um, and as we can see, you know, just by bonding into Klima, you know, over this last week, that there was no new carbon brought on chain, but we still bonded during that entire time, and that affected the price of carbon on chain to where we've now seen almost you know, another half million tons brought on chain in the last couple of days yeah that was incredible that that was like a for me it was a it was a almost i hesitate to say proof of concept because we've already kind of proved the concept but it showed how quickly i guess we can actually affect the price of the bct token you know when i saw that uh we were slightly below the traditional market carbon price i was wondering if it was going to take uh you know weeks or a month to kind of get get above that and it was like three or four days pretty quick <laughs> Well, and, and from a like from a policy standpoint, um, the other big thing that we've done, um, you know, is is we've shifted a lot of our capacity over to just the straight reserve bonds because you know when we launched, we didn't have nearly enough liquidity for what we were doing volume wise, and since then, you know, we've really gotten to a point where our utilization is much better um, from a percentage standpoint. So the protocol in and of itself doesn't need to incentivize that liquidity as much. That's where, you know, we can divert more of our bonding towards those reserve assets, which 
that it, it's a more efficient way for us to grow runway and you know provide that sustainability to stakers and the protocol as well as it, it just it lets us be a little bit more flexible yep so this brings me to my next question right like when it comes to the policy team right what levers do you have to control all this liquidity pool or like the liquidity of like Klima, BCT, and uh, the USDC pools. So the, the big the big levers we have are the biggest one is the the APY and the reward rate. That's that's the the universally like one of the biggest ones uh, because you know our rewards to stakers are um, by far the majority of what our new mint our, our new uh, minting of Klima goes towards. The other thing is like we've got this thing called a, a bond control variable, and it took me <laughs> it took me longer than I'd like to admit to uh, to really grasp that one, um, but really like that just kind of controls the rate at which those discounts that you see the bonds happen change. By changing those, and, and they change, you know, when we make changes, we, we make changes over, you know, it, over a few days ideally to enact those changes but utilizing those those variables we can basically increase or decrease our, our like pool of clima that we want to sell basically every day from the protocol's perspective and where we want to sell it from um, those are the those are the two really big ones that we discuss quite a bit although the reward rate in apy that's that's more of a you know a really long term kind of planning it out kind of thing. So reducing the reward rate is important because you know the supply is increasing and the more rewards that are distributed, that eats up more of this bond revenue. And as we reduce the reward rate, more of the BCT goes to backing the existing clima. There's less distributed, so you know we don't get, uh, I guess, too much inflation. You could say, but like, how important is it to to reduce the reward rate uh, at certain levels? As, as far as like keeping the keeping the reward rate in sync with uh, what our bond revenues are and, and what you know we're projecting in the future, because that gets you know exponential. Uh, the longer and longer we go, we have to bring in more and more revenue, obviously. To to sustain that runway and to keep ourselves sustainable. I think Olympus having already been through this with their reduction and kind of some volatility that ensued, I think it paved the way. It's like, uh, you know, the second or third child getting it easier than the first child. You know, you have that flexibility to make these decisions that you've seen are necessary and effective, you know, earlier in a protocol's life. So I think sustaining the higher APY wasn't really necessary. It's good to have that happen when it happened, in my opinion, and for the community to come together and become educated on that front. Yeah, and that's kind of where yeah, a lot of the things that that you know, education is a big part of what we're doing because we've got so many new people that are just new to crypto in general, let alone new to you know these style of mechanics and rebasing tokens. Sorry to just jump a few steps back, right? You you mentioned about this thing called BCV. So for even for some of these uh, crypto natives, right, people who are very familiar with uh, crypto itself, don't even understand what BCV is. So the thing that I like to ask is, right, this is just my own take. Is it true that how you control the BCV determines the health and the sustainability of the protocol itself? Yeah. So I think that's that's something we, you know, on, on the policy team, you know, we've debated especially you know at the start you know what exactly you know what those weights should be what are we trying to incentivize that's kind of what it comes down to and at the same time like we didn't want to have you know continuous bonding because uh, on the other hand if you've got you know a perpetual discount going on bonds the, the treasury is actually losing money right because you're you're selling it at a discount so ideally you know what we're selling on the protocol level should should meet the demand and if you know if we see that bonds are constantly negative or you know at a lower discount than what you know we're comfortable selling them at overall you know that's an indicator to policy if you hey you know we could increase capacity a little bit maybe we need to shift some capacity around 
uh, depending on what the bond types are. But you know that that's an indicator I know that we've looked at because if you've always got a discount, either there's not very much demand, or you're just discounting it so much that you're actually losing out on revenue. So you're saying that if you see that it's always discount means that it will we might be giving up on more revenue, mm-hmm. but rather than just to you know grow the protocol itself. Yeah. So like right now, our our average discount sits around four and a half to five percent. If people were snagging, you know, if people weren't bonding, and 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 our if our if our BCDs were at a point where like you know we were all of a sudden bonding, you know, like ten percent discounts all the time, we're bas- we're basically giving away five percent of our revenue for free. But like you know the the actual price premium on Klima can also affect capacity. So if you, if you look at the minting dashboard, you can tell that when the Klima price has had a, a decline. For a rebase or two, there's really not much bonding, and that's because the price changed. So, so like the debt that the bond held already, it didn't allow for more bonding. But then when it's come back up, it also increases some of that capacity as well. And that's honestly that's just a way of the of the protocol remaining efficient um, and trying to to maximize what we're selling. It's really fascinating how a lot of these things, you know, on one hand sort of are almost autonomous, but on the other hand, they do need to be managed. I mean, they do have to be managed for this to be a long-term success, which is what really gets me excited about Olympus and KlimaDAO is that they're really geared towards longevity, you know, to be able to accrue enough carbon to increase the price in the traditional market for, you know, to continue doing that and grow and, and having a bigger and bigger effect on the traditional market. We have to be around for, you know, three, four, 10, 20 years, right? I, I, I was going to say, like, you know, my time frame on this is decades. You know, 2050 is the is the goal that, you know, COP26 set out. And that's only 28 years away, almost. <laughs> yeah, it's my target, uh, target retirement date. Actually, it's a lot sooner oh. than that, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mine's, like, in a few years' time. Like, maybe, like, in that's one right. or two years' time. <laughs> not, not too far off, yeah. but I'll, I'll still be there. I'll still be around. But, but yeah, so so it's like yeah, it's like you know, for, so when a lot of times you know some of the decisions we're making or, or what we're looking at, um, we're really looking at what the long term success and, and sustainability for for Klima is, because um, we're we're going to be here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to kind of go back to the bonding to talk a little bit about uh, dilution's a hot topic. We've kind of we've kind of grazed by this topic a few times so far in terms of bonding dynamics and long-term protocol health. You know, we want to grow the treasury. We also want to make sure that our existing, you know, Klima holders are, you know, holding on to value, holding on to a share of the growing supply. And um, and dilution, to my understanding, I want you to kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but is um, is growth of supply over the current index Maybe you could kind of walk us through a little bit about that. How we manage that? Do we do we pay attention to dilution? Are we are we kind of worried about it? I've heard some people say that perhaps maybe it's not a big deal for Klima because our underlying asset is appreciating. We're we're trying to to appreciate the underlying carbon asset, and so perhaps that actually offsets dilution. Uh, what what are your thoughts on that? It's an interesting question because it it really does kind of get it to the core of you know what Klima is. Um, you know, and are we, are we going to be a, a you know a, a currency? Are we going to be you know this kind of asset that is backed by carbon that should appreciate? So let's just get all the carbon in to appreciate it faster. I bounce back and forth on this one uh, personally. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, that's fair, right? Because because the other thing is like it's so new that there's no there's no one to look back on, right? There's no textbook. Yeah, so it's it's like it's like you know I. I'm leaning more towards let's just let, let's just suck all the carbon in. Yeah, you know, the, the key the key in all of this, I I believe, is you know, dilution is going to happen just because of how the protocol works. But at the same time, if we can offset that dilution with additional value, and not just in the token prices, right? I mean, in in carbon prices. I mean, there's we've got so many you know ideas and projects in the DAO that are being worked on. To, to increase and utilize both Klima and carbon, those will all be value drivers. 
which ultimately lead back to climate. Because, you know, realistically, long term, all upward carbon demand is going to be upward positive demand for climate, too, because we're backed by that carbon. Yeah. Uh, could you just maybe explain, you just kind of alluded to that long term there, too. Um, obviously, we talked about APY already and kind of like how that's going to reduce over time, and it has, and that makes sense for the strength and resilience of the protocol. Um, but could you maybe just talk about how maybe mirroring those different stages that were put out there with the the vote on APY, like how do you see those different stages developmentally for the protocol as a whole? And, and how does the value creation or value proposition for the investor change over those different stages? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're in the integrations phase right now. And that's really, you know, we're, we're, we're building out this ecosystem where we've obviously drawn a lot of attention to climate, to carbon, to the solutions that the you know, blockchain can provide for carbon on a greater scale uh, other than just a marketplace. So that's really exciting. Moving through the other phases, you know, you know, adoption and stabilization, I think that's really where some of the fun can begin. You know, the, the integrate, you know, discovery, you know, it's like, oh, this is this new thing. And, and integrations, we're building out this we're, we're, we're finding partners and we're building out this cool ecosystem and, and playing and seeing what's possible, what works, right? Uh, what makes sense. And if Klima and, you know, the broader blockchain ecosystem here can get to where we own the carbon market on chain, I mean, we, we've definitely gotten past adoption and we're going to stabilize somewhere in there, you know? And then it becomes, it's not so much about providing that speculation. Um, will this blockchain experiment succeed? Um, because it, it has at that point, you know. And, and so we won't need to have that huge APY um, to, to, pay, you know, to pay out stakers either. Because, you know, if you've got 250 million Klima tokens... You know, we'd have to be bringing in a whole lot of carbon every day to keep paying out what we're paying now. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so for people that got drawn to the protocol by those juicy APYs, you know, as you did when you're telling your story, you know, about uh, Ohm and those uh, early Polygon protocols too. You know, it, just to point out that it's not saying the party is over when the APY is going down, but what you're pointing out there is the party is really just getting started when it comes to some really important things, right? Oh yeah, totally. Even if we're paying thirty percent APY, that's insane. <laughs> I, you know, like in, in my brain, it's like that's some of the stuff. It's like it's just like this is insane. And the cool thing is, by the time we hit that stabilization phase, um, and, and definitely the maturity, but like you know, the adoption and stabilization phase, um, and, and I'm I'm really keen to see um, what happens with Olympus on this front. Um, and we have the advantage of being able to kind of observe them and learn learn from them as well on this too. It's like, you know, we get to this point where we've got most of the carbon, we've stabilized, we're adopted. There doesn't need to be as much volatility in the climate token, right? Because it, it's stabilized. And so getting that, you know, 25, 30% additional tokens every year, well, if the, if the price is really stabilized and become more, you know, predictable in that regard, you know, that's just more confidence down the road, too. Yeah, so here's here's a question for you again. I'd still like to tie it to those phases that we're talking about, but perhaps a question, you know, more dreaded than the comfortable BCVs and BCTs is, why is the price so low right now? <laughs> but, you know, is there a way to, like, frame that in terms of your expectations of, you know, developmentally where the protocol's at versus, you know, what the open market is going to do and how it's going to interact with the protocol? Um, I think, yeah, so this is, this is an interesting one. There's two different prices for Klima. There's the U.S. dollar tr price, which we all see, know, and love. Um, and we see charts on all the time. And that one's going to be affected by you know, activity in 
you know, demand on BCT, up or down, demand on Klima, up or down. And honestly, the overall market sentiment too, right? The other price is the, the BCT price. And that's, you know, the price that the, the protocol looks at. We're still at a, a really you know, relatively low premium, very relatively low premium of 48 to 50, like right around 50 BCT per Klima. So, you know, I've, I've felt much more comfortable um, in the last few weeks. Um, you know, as I'm sure, I, I hope, you know, other people have that, you know, we've kind of hit, you know, a floor and, you know, hitting some actual, you know, price discovery um, after the insanely hyped launch that we had. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but just to bring it back to like that, the, the crux of my question there too, though, is like, do you see that price as being, let's just say, developmentally appropriate, I guess, or <laughs> whatever the right word is there, you know, for where we're headed and where we are at? I mean, I'd, I'd always like to see it higher, personally, because that, that would just be better for the protocol and, and more efficient for the protocol. I, I'm the, the the metrics that I've, and I don't. I, I'm not trying to dodge the price question. Uh, it's just I, I actually I'm, I've been looking at some of the other like like the RFV backing per token and really tracking more of our treasury growth because that's where in the short term that's that's where we're going to make waves and and provide value back. You know, ultimately provide value back into all of our stakers is by growing that treasury, which ultimately rewards everybody for staking and sticking you know, with the protocol by having a more valuable treasury along the way. I see. So this is what I understand as of now. You know, a lot of people are focused on the price, like just like what Fidris actually shared about, like why Klima is so low, right? But what I'm getting the sense of it is that you're not really that focused on price, but rather the health of the protocol itself, like how healthy the treasury is, how much revenue we're bringing into the protocol, that actually will translate into the price movement down the road. It's just that currently the price is not reflecting the the health of the protocol itself. Am I right to say that? Yep. yep I exactly. See. Yeah, I wanted to, um, you know, we mentioned a, f- a few times already about, you know, potential downfalls or or weaknesses in uh, other protocols or even just risks to Klima. You know, Klima is an experimental protocol to a degree. I mean, it feels less and less experimental, even though we're only nine weeks in. But the thing that I've been really interested in is diving into the resiliency of this model, thinking about protocol-owned liquidity, thinking about the dynamics of the bond discount, building additional revenue streams, from a policy standpoint, you know, I'm interested in the resiliency and, and, and weathering different storms. Can you speak a little bit about how, you know, policy um, may play a role? When I say policy, I mean, you know, adjusting different variables in the protocol that affect the, the you know, the financial performance of it. How is that uh, adjusted in different market conditions to ensure that we continue to execute on our mission of uh, driving up the price of carbon? Yeah, so um, in order to help the, you know, ideally the protocol should take advantage of of any uh, you know market condition. Whether you know if our if our if we have another round of you know crazy hype and our price pumps up all the way, like we should definitely take advantage um, of that premium and bond as much you know carbon into the treasury you know as possible at that point in time because it's more efficient. Right. The higher the token price, the more BCT it costs to buy each Klima token. Exactly. You know, and, on, and on the flip side, I, I, I think the, the big market condition is you know, going from having no liquidity to having enough mm-hmm. for where we are. Mm-hmm. You know, from the policy standpoint, reacting to that and saying, okay, let's switch over to, to reserve bonds that helps everything that helps educate the community on what's going on. Um, We've been through a lot and, and it helps us. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps us, it helps us maintain the, the strength and, you know, potentially increase the, the strength of the treasury in kind of these downtimes as well. You know, we've, we've, 
yes, the price went down, but our liquidity actually didn't go down as much. Yeah, for the listeners, just to give some context here. So we're nine weeks into the protocol at the time of this recording, and we uh, launched a very, a very hyped up launch. I remember that day where on October 18th, I actually wasn't sure if I was going to be home, so I trained my wife in how to like <laughs> use MetaMask <laughs> and make a transaction on Sushi Swap. Like I was going to be, I was going to be in it right in that first candle, yeah. and um, and it got delayed a little bit, and I got home and I was able to do it, <laughs> but but. Um, you know, that was a hyped, I remember the uh, Discord was just on fire that day. Like it was hyped oh, up. It was like a hot NFT drop, crazy. you know, like, and so the yeah. price, the price yeah. shoots up and, you know, it has to come back down to earth uh, f- for the health of the protocol, really. And at that same time, leverage became an option. And a lot of people, maybe without a ton of experience in leverage, availed themselves of taking a leverage long position in Klima. And unfortunately, because the price has to come down after it shoots up, you know, um, very quickly, a lot of liquidations ensued. So that kind of accelerated the sell off. And so in the first nine weeks, we, we hit sky high valuation and, and then a 90, nearly 90%, I guess, sell off, you know, because of these cascade of liquidations and it, and we're turning it down. So, so really a, a tumultuous early phase. And yet at the same time, our, Holders are growing to over sixty thousand. Our liquidity is reaching over hundred million dollars in value <clears throat> to be able to support this, and people are becoming more and more bullish. So, uh, you know, I think the protocol is in a very strong point right now. We're and the, I guess the number one thing really is that we've shown that we're actually able to increase the price of carbon in the traditional market, which is our primary mission. So to live through that early has hardened i think our community and really been an early stress test to where now i think a lot of people are extremely optimistic and 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 you know another thing for me really is you know klima yes we're we're in the crypto market right as well but we're also tied more to the carbon market mm-hmm. which is completely separate from the rest of the, the current crypto space. And a lot of probably the broader economy too, to a degree. Yep. yep. Right. And so I, I know that there's a lot of people who bought that that super high peak, but the market cap from where the peak was is, you know, we were at like a $1.1 billion market cap. Oh, yeah. That was crazy. In, in like eight days. It was insane. Right. And we're at uh, yeah, 420 million now. Yeah. So I mean, so even though that price, and that's kind of where you know, the you know the rebases and that that compounding can start to you know, it, it's a time game for the compounding to really kick in, and and pay those dividends back. That's what's kind of amazing to me with these styles of with these protocols is that you can have these huge price swings, but ultimately, we still have something that's that's backing it, which. Yeah. The right. Protocols, yeah, like marching, the protocols on. marching on. We're still building things. We're still, you know, enabling this ecosystem, this brand new experimental ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're sitting here at the very, you know, tail end of 2021. You know, uh, Reg was just talking about, you know, how tumultuous the last few weeks have been from launch, and it's definitely been a pretty awesome ride to be on for sure. Now, if you, you know, turn the page and you're looking at 2022 on your calendar there, is there any alpha that you can drop for us about what you think or what you expect to be coming around the corner, maybe in Q1, Q2 of uh, 2022 for the protocol? I mean, I think, you know, we, we've already seen that uh, that request for comment from Moss um, on that stuff. And I, I don't think that they are uh, the only ones that are hanging out there as far as, you know, more bridges and more assets for us to kind of diversify and and really have Klima stand out on its own. So something you'll probably see from me come Q1 is a lot of the, uh, it'll be more just generalized carbon references on the dashboard. And, you know, as, as the work and what we've done has enabled some more players to enter the space with their own uh, spin. You know, because that's, that's kind of the cool thing about crypto too, you know, the whole decentralization side of things. You know, like 
there can be, you know, just like there's Uniswap and SushiSwap and, you know, Balancer and, and all these other places, there can be more than one bridge as well. So, and more than one type of carbon asset too. So that'd be remarkably good news and a good indicator for the protocol. Uh, but as a dashboard guru here, that's got to make your life yeah, a little, little bit, challenging but too. I mean, it, you know, it's also, it's, it's also really kind of cool because it lets me extract a few things away and, and you know, overall we're, you know, we'll, we'll be doing better for the protocol as well. So here comes my last question. My, my favorite question all, of all time, actually. So where do you see Klima in 2033? I mean, I think come 2033, you know, we'll have established Klima as, you know, the facilitator and the market maker for the carbon market, especially the voluntary carbon market and ideally the international market as well. Whether that's working with partners to, you know, enable different exchanges or, you know, pe people can buy Klima um and and lock it up or stake it to have that impact and have access to uh, be able to to offset their own impact on the earth that that that'd be what i where i see it you know just kind of being that overall index for what what carbon's worth cuz there's endless amounts of carbon that we need to take out of the atmosphere yep totally man like i feel that's the difference that klima has over other protocols like for example even we talk about like olympus itself right because the stable assets it's die right it's usd right in a sense but when it comes to klima itself it's it's worldwide right we when i mean of course that's another topic altogether about bitmos and itmos and whatever we have on in terms of the compliance market right and through klima i think that's the part where we can able to touch we can or rather tap on markets that are like you know worldwide markets international markets that you know people will eventually see the use of klima in their books for example mm -hmm. And, you know, as far as like, and I've, I've, I'm just still, you know, learning on the whole carbon financing and project financing and all that, but just as an investment vehicle and a financing and you know, capital distribution method and incentivization, like that'd be huge to help people in, in countries where it, it's, it's still insane to me that it's more economical to cut down forest you know for grazing than it is to to keep the forest there and if we can incentivize that and make that a reality for people to essentially farm their forest why not and i'll I'll touch back on something i think that that first question you know like you know, like why clima and what got me interested in this and and really the one of the reasons i've decided to dedicate you know my time into the protocol is um, the fact that this is, this has like a real world impact, and like that's what's exciting to me is is making that real world difference rather than just making numbers happen on a computer. So I think that's that's what really drew me in um, to to Klima and, and staying involved. That's awesome, <laughs> awesome, man! Thank you very much, Kujo, for sharing all these things and being here with us. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. It kind of puts a nice, uh, a nice ribbon out there to have that forward-looking vision at the end. And I think, uh, I think we've hit all of our key questions there. So really appreciate your uh, your time and your excellent insights you provided with us. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Thanks, Kujo. Yeah, thanks for yeah, thanks for having me. Wow, what a great conversation. I don't know, it's just so easy to see how Cujo is an incredible asset for the Klima policy team, but also just for the broader climate community with that uh, Klima uh, dashboard on Dune that he's created. Just so much information is shared there and readily available for anybody to explore. I don't know about you two, but I was really just, you know, blown away to get that, you know, kind of uh, walk through for the dashboard and that look at the minting dashboard too, just to realize there are so many metrics 
beyond the cover story, beyond the price that people might be looking at in USD that really speak to the overall health of the protocol. Um, yeah, so for key takeaways, how about you, Reg? What really stuck with you? I really enjoyed his um, his take on dilution, you know, how Clima is such a unique protocol and that our underlying asset is uh, increasing in value. That's something Asafi mentioned too, and that we're balancing uh, kind of both sides, you know, there are pros and cons to this debate. You know, our, our, and focusing on our primary mission of driving up the price of carbon is really the focus. Dilution is getting a lot of uh, talk on Twitter, crypto Twitter these days, but I think Klima is in a unique position where, and, and to be frank, our, our, our dilution is managed very conservatively, but you know, we can, we can tolerate it. And it's actually, uh, if you look at it, can be considered a good thing for our protocol uh, because it uh, is helping us execute our, our primary mission. So I think overall, really fascinating interview and I learned quite a bit. Oh, 100%. Uh, Diamond Hands, how about you? What really struck with you about uh, the conversation with Kujo there? Yeah, like for me, it's more about, because I'm more of a numbers guy, right? And you know, a lot of people talk about the price of Klima, it's down, but he really shared like a lot of insights, like how healthy the matrix are, the treasury is, like the RV, all this information that uh, you know it's all found in the tune that but uh when you really dive deep like again like what you mentioned earlier in the beginning of the show it's like we dive deep into the hood of klima and when you see all this matrix you realize that yes the price might be down but the health it's super healthy it's just we're just waiting for the time to explode so that's my take and i really enjoyed this conversation with kujo so yeah hopefully you enjoyed that uh conversation with kujo too for everything Klima, make sure you're hitting up klimadao.finance, our official website, where you can stake, bond, and I think most importantly, find a link to the Klima Discord community under the community button there. As a decentralized autonomous organization, or DAO, Klima is community-driven, just like this very podcast. So join us and you'll find a great group of climates and plenty of opportunities to contribute to be an active climate too. So we hope you really enjoyed this conversation with Kujo. Thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to saying hello once again on the very next Planet of the Climates.